Welcome, everybody, to a Brutally Honest Talk Radio. This is Elmo the Conservative. Uh, Inger, the podcast queen, is not with us today, but we have a guest on the show, and his name is Matthew Garnier. So he's going to talk for a minute, just tell you a little about himself, and then, hey, we're going to just, just jump in and have a conversation, talk about a couple of things. Matthew, how are you doing? And uh, yeah, tell people a little, little about yourself. I'm doing well, thanks. I'm glad to be here. I, uh, I enjoy the, the, the tagline of Brutally Honest. That's definitely a theme in my uh, persona, I guess. I, I, like to, I like to get real. So this is going to be good. I haven't done a lot of, um, you know, talking about political and social things necessarily, but I am an open book and quite literally in that I recently published a book where I talked about my, my upbringing, which was very, very heavily focused on church. I, I think it, it shaped my personality in a lot of ways, both in that I identify with certain things about it and that I kicked back against certain things about it. So I, sure. see, I see things from every side, whether that's a blessing or a curse. I really tend to see both angles whenever there's any kind of you know, political or cultural disagreement. So I, I always have feelings, but I, I know how to keep them close to the chest when I have to. I was in the Catholic Church when I was a kid, uh, probably out of out of church for maybe 10, 12 years, and then began seeking God, like at a time where I had everything else, but had a had a void, which was like a, a spiritual void. But in any case, I, I know that uh, that the church or certain churches or denominations can push people away with legally legalism and hypocrisy yep so it's like you need to look like you're holy and abide by these rules at least on sunday when we see you and then the other six days of the week you may see me the leadership doing something like i can't even live up to what i'm preaching exactly and and that that puts a bad taste in people's mouth and they can you know some some people stay out of a church for uh, 10 years or 20 years because of that. Yeah, it's a shame because that that spiritual void that you describe is a very real thing. You know, I think that comes from a from a real place where people are trying to connect with the unknown. You know, they don't want to live within the limits of just what they understand. They want that community. They want whatever connection they can attain with a higher power, you know, but then of course human problems, human nature is going to get in the way, especially when I think in certain leadership structures, you know, that does um, tend to corrupt certain people sometimes, you know, just power in sure. general. And there are, you know, there are those cases that are sometimes just comically extreme where somebody is railing against a certain uh, sin or lifestyle or whatever. And then you're like, you were exactly that you were doing these things while yeah. preaching against it. And I, I don't have that experience of something so radically hypocritical, but I've, I've seen it, you know, I've seen how it affects other people and I don't blame them for wanting to get far from a church. You know, for me, I, I haven't been to church in a while just because I find that sense of spirituality in, in other ways. But um, I know there are so many different experiences people have that are just absolutely wild. So, yeah, and um, you know that's a thing. And then also with the church, uh, there there are certain things that they don't want to talk about or don't want to say. So it's like basically whatever your religion is, and whatever the Bible or the Quran is of that religion, the Bible is book that you live by. That that's supposed to be what that religion revolves around. So a, a preacher should not have a problem speaking or reading any part of that Bible, or, or maybe he should question himself if he really wants to be a part of that. And uh, my, my pastor, he's been in meetings with other pastors, and I'm in Atlanta, and some of the other pastors have said, no, I don't, I don't tell people that uh, divorce is wrong, or, or tell them that, that this sin or that sin is bad because I don't want to lose church members. Yeah. And meaning really they, they don't want to lose money. 
<laughs> that's very true yes money and money is a powerful force but the bible i mean if you if you really want to study the bible it, it raises very tough questions and there's depending on what spin you're trying to create i mean i i could construct a sermon probably f- propagating two competing messages both citing the bible if i'm disingenuous and i have an agenda you know, so that's yeah. where the human motivations can be very dangerous. Whatever you're in, and I've, I've done some, some uh, studying of other religions, Judaism and Islam and uh, uh, Buddhism and whatnot, Wh- whatever, whatever they're teaching, whatever they're saying, if you see red flags in your own religion that make you want to run, well, I would say one thing is ask the leadership about it because they're supposed to be more knowledgeable than you are. What about this thing? What is what does this mean? And and then and then make a decision. You know. Yeah, it's but, interesting how there's an element of trust in any decision. You know, at the end of the day, we can't all be complete experts on every matter. So there ends yeah. up being some point where you defer to either someone else's judgment or the weight of experiences you've had over your time, and you know, yeah. ones that you give more value to than others. And I think that applies across the board, even beyond religion. You know, there's certain things where you you, you may not have a perfect picture, but you piece together yeah. components of what you have and you go, well, this is this is my best shot. And so I think for that reason, the most important value to me is that someone is at least honestly trying to put together a cohesive pr- picture from what they have and willing to admit that that is subject to change. You know, there, there may be strongholds and pillars where you say, like, I feel very confident of that because I either had a very real experience or so many people I trust agree with this. But at the end of the day, you know, all of it could potentially be shifted by something, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, I know how familiar you may be with Jordan Peterson. He's one of my heroes and... Uh, Uh, one of my mentors, and I I like the thing that he said about, I live my life as if the Bible is true or as if uh, there is a God. So that that kind of keeps keeps people in control and from, you know, going out of bounds and and doing things that they they should not do. So that's that's a great thing. And I I like it how uh, another person said, when I when I do what the Bible says, my life is better. I get results than if I go against it or do the opposite of it. Yeah. So that's so. that's the moral framework of belief in God. And I think there's several different frameworks from which people approach it. There's, you know, some who are exclusively looking at it from a perspective of self-protection or salvation. Others who yeah. believe, you know, culturally we need this. It's what keeps us stable yeah. and grounded. And I guess individually as well, that would be the moral perspective. And I think the way that Jordan Peterson puts it is interesting because he's saying the same thing as Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician philosopher, said uh, in Pascal's Wager, which is basically the the mentality of I'll act as if I believe so that I'm saved to avoid risk. I'll sacrifice anything. Mm -hmm. But Jordan Peterson is saying it because he's got this profoundly poetic sense that the Bible is more than a human book to where he even said to Mm -hmm. sam harris sam harris asked him do you think do do you not think that this could be written by men do you not think william shakespeare could have written old testament stories and he said no and and i was like wow okay so either you've got you're connecting with this on some level of genius i don't have or that's just a man who's really struck by the power of um archetypes i mean he says that a lot you know and but I understand. I understand the the just general feeling that there's a God and saying I need to posture myself reverently toward that. And I think that makes more sense than acting as if you know entirely what that means. Yeah. And um, yeah. I remember he, he was a very hot topic. You know, when I was back at my alma mater uh, as an employee, they would have these guest speakers often from either a conservative or Christian background. And, uh, and he was one of them. So, you know, people were really talking about him. And it came up, you know, the, the campus pastor was like trying to kind of convince Jordan Peterson to, 
pray a prayer of salvation in the classic church sense. And I remember my conversation with friends afterward was like, this is one person who I think feels that doctrinally they're a Christian and another person who's not as concerned with the label, but the one who I feel like is more Christian is the one who's keeping an open mind in Peterson. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he, he actually at, at least lives by what he says he believes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the last couple of years, he went through a lot of suffering. Yeah. Um, his daughter before that, where she had some kind of uh, almost paralyzed w- with um, like the bones in her in her ankles or something was impeding her from walking and just went through this uh, this really amazing, incredible uh, suffering. Uh, Peterson, do you do you know how he really got famous or when he kind of really got in the limelight of people? I mean, because I, of things he was saying, I just remember gradually seeing some of his lectures kind of pop up on YouTube. I don't know. It was there was there a big catalyst moment? <laughs> Yeah, you know, basically, like he's a, a professor at University of uh, uh, Vancouver or some some university in Canada, and uh, he was being pres- pressured and told to uh, basically uh, use the use the pronouns of transgenders that they want used, mm-hmm. and he said, "I'm not going to do that." And listen, you know, I've I've done some studying and reading uh, about psychology and, and even without knowing a lot, it seems like some kind of a delusion for people to believe that they they are something that, that they are not. And so you know, he just said, I'm, I'm not going to do this and I don't want to I don't want to lie to people. And it's a it's a mental problem for people that that are believing that they are a, a gender other than what they were born as. And I think he got fired. Uh, if, if he didn't get fired, there was some big controversy where he may have gotten suspended. But um, this this made the, you know, first the the local news, the national news, and then and people started inviting him on their shows to talk about it. And he would he would explain, you know, he would explain in a uh, in a logical way. So um, he's a brilliant guy anyway. And I've I've read um, two of his books, and most of his stuff is is he's a clinical psychologist, and talking about uh, different things. This is just not only in how you live your life, but you know, kind of why why people do what they do and their behavior, where that comes from. So that there's so much more to him. But you know, ironically, that's that's the thing that made him famous. I, to, I do you know, to the that. level he is now. Yeah, yeah. I actually did uh, see him speak at one point, and I'll come back to that. It was not because I bought a ticket to anything or whatever, but uh, you saw him in it, person. It, yeah, he he was at the school oh. that I referenced, um, and that was pretty eventful. Actually, it made some headlines because somebody ended up storming the stage, just desperate, like seeking him for healing. Oh. Like he was saying, "I'm not well." I saw that. I just yeah, that was that yeah, was I, I was working that. there at the time, and. Um, that, I mean, that just goes to show it's it's wild how he began as not even like not a political figure or anything like that. Yeah. But he somehow struck a chord with so many people that they were like, talk about everything. We will listen. Right. We want to be inspired right. by you. And um, right. I, I don't think he wanted to be characterized as the anti-trans guy because he wasn't trying, if I recall correctly, he wasn't trying to take a stand or at least to build his platform on this is, you know, wrong or convoluted in some sense, though I, I don't know how he would have explained himself at the time, but his main platform had to do with free speech. So right, right. He, he just felt like you break that part of the levy, the whole thing explodes. So it was a matter of principle. And, and so... The way that people end up looking at politics, which always gravitates to the extremes, was to say he's an anti-trans activist. He, in the, in the early years, he actually said outright, you know what, I, I will call my students what they want to be called. But then he ended up changing that and taking a different stance because he realized that 
that was he couldn't get around the feeling that he was being bullied into it and people were going to take advantage of him and he said you know what actually i think in a sense that's what everyone's doing when they ask to do this now i you know i'm paraphrasing a little bit there but Mm -hmm. i've i think it was sort of an evolution for him yeah so i was i was in a conversation with uh with someone last week and i'm I'm not going to say what the what the what the ensemble was it it was on a zoom platform but you know something else that i work in and uh this this woman was telling me that if you don't call people by their proper pronouns then i don't know she didn't say transphobic but something you know something uh mean or wrong and and she just she made this statement like she was talking about the gospel of jesus christ Mm-hmm. Like that's how affirmative she was about it. Like she was talking about a fact of quantum physics. Like, and, and this is this is basically a new thing because I would say that she and, and most people, they wouldn't have said that 10 years ago, or there there wasn't any any mention or talk of pronouns. Now, interestingly, because you know, when you're when you're logged into to YouTube, they figure out an algorithm for you and what you might like. So you know, I, I I don't know. I mean, it was a Jerry Springer clip that that came to me, and he he just died less than a week ago, so maybe that's why it it, it popped up. But so this uh this man dressed as a woman came on there, and it's real short, just a couple minutes. And this uh this dude that met him online came on there and said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna ask ask for her hand in marriage or something like that," and then. You know, the, the name of it was called I Have a Secret or something like that. So the the man came out like, you know, dress dressed like a woman. But so when um, when they brought the guy back out and, you know, he was like, nice to meet you, whatever. And the person was like, I have a secret. And they said, I am a man. And this was, you know, 25 or 30 yeah, years unheard ago. Unheard of. So it's like, <laughs> oh, OK. So back then, guys would dress like a woman or act like a woman, but say I'm a man. Right. Like they would they would at least be honest, honest about that, you know, about that part of it. And uh this person seemed very comfortable acting and talking the way that they were talking. So it's like it just it really feels like like lying to do that. And you know, I, I've thought about I I've just thought about this in the last few days. Like, you know, why why is it like uh so much support for this. So I think it's safe to say that uh, uh, transgender people are, are a subset of the gay community. And I think because of like uh, a, a gay uh, sympathy, like th- there's already kind of a, a, a sympathy for uh, the way that uh, some gay people have been treated over the years. Some people have been very mean to them and they've been pushed out or you know, discriminated against or rejected, whatever. Uh, so I, I think that's why it, it may have a lot of a lot of uh, straight people, a lot of support from people that are not jumping on. And you know, if you think about uh, you think about the the furries. Hmm. I don't know if you you heard about that, I'm right? Familiar, the group of people, yeah. yeah. Right? They they identify they identify uh, as a certain animal or the trans racial people. So, like, there, there are many different ways where somebody can can uh, not be comfortable with what they are and want to be called what they what what they would what they would like to be, and uh, so I, I just think that's the reason that it's considered like a, a a part of the you know because of being a part of the gay community that is getting that's getting so much support. Yeah, but. I think uh, anyway. uh, I think in any of these issues where it potentially opens the door to a logical slippery slope, mm-hmm. it's it's important to look for what might be the genuine component at the very heart of the matter. And of course, there's going to be all kinds of people trying to jump in and just either yeah. just trying to be hyper progressive or just claiming yeah. things to set a fire. But, you know, I think it sometimes starts with a, a general realization, of course, for people who don't feel connected to their identity, that's I think that's sincere. Um, 
mm-hmm. and that whether or not I agree with the conclusion and how they deal with it. But, um, you know, maybe a sense that like sexuality doesn't seem to fit within uh, binary confines. Like that's debatable too, but I think it comes from a real feeling that people have. And I may not see the logic in the conclusion, um, but I it, it becomes very difficult to see through all the noise and find what's who's being sincere and genuine and yeah. whose voice really does matter in all of it. I know even within yeah. the LGBTQ anything, there is division as well about that issue because sure. it's a little bit, there are, I, I guess, logical forces that are somewhat at odds with each other, even therein. I, I, I'll let that community speak to it themselves, but because um, there's things I will never understand about it. But mm-hmm. I, weird pivot here that might, <laughs> I don't know, might be a little radical, but I think some I've no, seen go, go some, ahead. We said we said so much brutally honest, so yeah. Much, uh, kickback on this show that uh, you, you, <laughs> I've I've seen a, a parallel between the way that some people believe in God and the transgender logic, which is to say, because I can't make sense of what I do experience, I'm going to act as if something that is other or on the other side of a logical partition does make sense to me as if that's a more sure thing. Um, That's a big picture way of putting it, but the, the logical leap seems to sort of be the same. Yeah. That's, that's just going to upset people on both sides of this. I know, but. um, And then there, there's this thing of like, like you said, within their own community, like if you if you don't get out and hold up a sign and fight for me, then that's hatred and silence is violence. And I, I need you to, you know, like the, the tennis player, Navitarola, who is gay, and they came after her because um, something with the, with the uh, transgender, you know, there was a conflict there. Like they wanted to push her out and. Yeah, free speech is important. Let people say what they what they want. And it, it's better for the individual to speak for themselves instead of attaching them to a group or saying that the group or a leader of a group can speak for me. Because people are people are very different. And you know, they they're I think they're just trying to be comfortable with themselves because the straight community the things that we like and, and like to do uh, in private, we're not, I mean, some, some people put it out there and talk about it on social media, but, but we're not trying to get people to uh, accept and embrace what we're doing. But anyway, so that's a, that's a thing. It's going to, it's going to keep moving um, on one side or the other becoming, you know, more, more extreme or less over time. So um, anyway, just just talking on that and, and just, you know, just just the attacking of, of people because you, you don't you don't want to believe or accept uh, what they're saying or, or what they want you to believe. Yeah, I, right. I think there there are times when I mean, I guess the phrase silence is violence is yet another one of those things where it's like it's at the core, there's something that may be true, but then it's taken in the extreme cancel culture direction and it becomes something else where like yeah there's times when something does concern you and you shouldn't just stand by there's also many issues that do not concern every single one of us and we don't need to hop on that bandwagon because at the end of the day we're just diluting the voices that actually should speak by trying to act like ours matters more and again massively convoluted yeah even with uh so-called hate speech you can't silence people because as soon as you do that or try to pass a law then there's an argument about well what what is hate is anything that offends me oh okay well i'm offended that you believe that jesus is the son of god and he died for our sins so you need to be quiet now and if somebody wants to get up in church and say that well it's a law so we can have you arrested like that's the that's one of the directions that that will go in 
<laughs> you know? Yeah, it is. So, it is uh, subjective. I mean, you know, you can ask what is inciting violence? What is anything? Yeah. And it's weird because like the Constitution is also, you know, subject to interpretation. And so at the end of the day, there's there's things where you I guess I'm viewing it kind of like I view the Bible. <laughs> you can't always have an empirical uh, interpretation of it. And so everything is always to some extent going to be open to discussion. So, yep. you know, I guess that's why democracy is a, a noble way of government, because at the end of the day, yeah. it is by the people for the people. So, um, And then even, even um, whatever someone may believe or the transgenders or whoever, they have much, much more freedom to do what they're doing and say what they're saying and have a uh, public assembly than any other country. Like you think other countries are nice. I mean, look, look how Canada flipped in the last 10 years, yeah. you know, just, and I've been there many times being from Detroit, you know, so close and just the nicest people you ever want to meet. And they just, they just flipped and, you know, trying to take people's guns away. And so, people are people should be fortunate to be able to express themselves yeah yeah here the, the way that they the way that they do and you know I, and i'll kind of wrap with this but like there, there's been times when i jumped on the bandwagon of like oh man america's going down the toilet things are so crazy right now and then i'm just like what a what a remarkable thing it is to at least have a generally welcoming and cohesive culture you know, like, yes, yeah. there are issues and we're collectively working towards fixing them and hopefully always moving in, in the right direction. But um, the fact that the fact that it, it works at all, it's like, be grateful yeah. for that, you know, and view it as a, a collective endeavor. And I think it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and you know, a, a fairly young country and to to have so much freedom and be as powerful as we are, as young as we are, and maybe the only the only country that faced civil war and didn't actually split up, you know, and have that unity. So, hey, uh, it was great having you on the show, and already know that I, I want to have you back another time because well, there's you know a couple other things that that uh you know I'd like to talk about. But we're just just running out of time. But anyway, uh, this is Matthew Garnier, and uh, you want to mention your your book real quick? Swept up lessons from the end times on Amazon. Everybody, this is brutally honest talk radio. Uh, remember, if you're watching or listening on YouTube, subscribe, click the notification bell. Uh, we have a group that you can follow on Facebook, and we're on Twitter and Spotify. God bless everybody. We'll catch you on the next show.